Simpson of the Select Committee on Health and Social Services in the National Council of Provinces. I want you to relax, um, take a deep breath. When you've been stressed out, take a sip of water. And I'm glad that you are smiling. Enjoy this interview with us. I will hand over to the chairperson in the committee room to introduce herself and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, yeah, welcome, Mr. Michali Pedro Mzileni. You must relax. Baba, get relax. It's just an interview. Yeah, just an interview. One plus one, two. Two plus two is four. Plus, plus 20 is 24. <laughs> Minus 24 is zero. So you must relax. <laughs> uh, my name is Nontlantlan Ngobendaba. I'm, uh, I'm the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities. I'm co-chairing this subcommittee with the Honorable Chair. Uh, who was just welcoming you now. Uh, you are welcome. Feel free. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, I'm going to ask you to ask me to ask So that's why we kept reassuring you, Guti, just relax. Uh, your mic must be on. I'm uh, going switch you off. Uh, as soon as you start to introduce her, in my care, we eagerly on. Um, Honorable Masiko. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and thank you for the maths literacy uh, class that you have just taken us through. A very good evening to you, Mr. Mzileni. My name is uh, Figile Masiko. I am a member of this subcommittee. You are welcome and the very best for your interview. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Good evening, Mr. Mzileni. My name is Otto Malika. I'm a member of the subcommittee. You are welcome and good luck for the interview. Thanks to the, the Chairpersons. Uh, my name is Louis Olompiti, and I'm a member of this uh, committee. Wishing you well. Ngozi Kosla Lobobabini. Molo now and Chagas, Gumbule Lopaha, Lilungu, Lale Committee, and Goskaku. Thank you very much, Chairpersons, and uh, good evening, Mr. Mzilin. My name is Telisom Kweba, the member of this uh, committee. You are welcome and all the best. Reperile Mr. Mzileni, Vitoni Brenda Matibula, ni member of this subcommittee. Good evening, Mr. Mzileni. My name is Buitumelo Joyce Maluleke, member of this subcommittee, and I wish you well in this interview. Honorable Ndongeni. Ngozisan. Bosa <laughs> <laughs> I am a little and undong in Uzabe are so lily bell. Simkululi like a cool. Honorable Natasha Natasha, over to you, Chair. Chair. 
Chaperson. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, Mr. Mzileni, you are welcome. Uh, we have already assure, assured you that uh, you must just relax. Um, as in, I may care to eat and listen now. I beg an angel, I lay when I just say, beg a good tea, yeah, and then there was about comfortable. Why you? Oh, my son, they look like a cooler so because but my son, the Langa Lens Eco, Bessak Zogal. Yeah, thank you, Chair. President, thank you very much, Mr. Zelene. Um, can you briefly tell the panel? about yourself and then also um can you can you share with us your knowledge about the agency and also why you are interested to serve the young people of south africa as a board member of the nyda thank you thank you very much chair and uh, good evening to you and also to the rest of the panel. Uh, I was born in Zuelicha, uh, Buffalo City region, Eastern Cape, 29 years ago. And that is where I grew up. And that is where I also completed uh, my basic education schooling level. I am a product of a family of men and women who are black teachers and were highly committed in black education. After schooling, I went to Nelson Mandela University where I completed there uh, a junior degree, an honors degree, a master's degree, and then yesterday I submitted my PhD. During my studies, I also participated in the student movement where we fought against the whiteness and patriarchization of higher education we also dismantled the apartheid labor system that seemed to make security guards and catering officers as people who are junior and forever outsourced and oppressed. They were insourced ultimately. And I served all the structures of the student movement up to being the SRC president and also up in the upper structures of uh, the student youth movement. When I graduated from the student movement, I moved into senior management of the university serving in various committees like council, senate, the procurement committee, amongst others. I also got appointed as a senior manager in the vice chancellor's office, dean of students. And because of the productive work that I've been doing in that space, I also got appointed now as a lecturer in the department of, of sociology and anthropology, where I don't only do teaching, but I also develop courses. I supervise students to also complete their honors, masters, qualifications, amongst others. Some of them passed with distinctions last year, and I have two more that are submitting this December. From the productive work I've done in that level, I've also been commissioned by the Standard Bank Group and the Department of Education and Training to do a feasibility study on free education. That study was conducted in Brazil. We returned the report, and I think the current model that they are using now to, 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 to roll out free education is the one that came from that report. Also got appointed by the government of China on the rural redevelopment strategy that where we worked as 40 young researchers from 15 countries. Some of them couldn't speak English, but we made it work. And we submitted that report in the, gov in the provincial government of Gangzhou uh, and the mayor of, Jing of Jingwa in China. Now I've been invited also because of that work I've been doing by the SABC, Newsroom Africa, Mail and Guardian, many other publications regionally and nationally in the country and internationally to offer expert commentary on various issues facing young people and students and so on. My research study around my, the PhD was around the youth, youth development themes, uh, student livelihoods, and also the transformation of higher education and how can we link it and make it a, a productive resource for young people to streamline into the labor market. Now, why did I apply? I think the time, the space, and the context has now come for us now to begin interacting with empirical evidence when it comes to understanding and comprehending 
the challenges facing young people such as unemployment because clearly all the tools that we've been using in the past 20 years have not worked comprehensively and that is why the rate of unemployment amongst young people keeps on increasing. So it means that the tools that we've been applying over the past few years have not worked comprehensively and also we must also be impatient with people who are going to come and, and repeat uh, those tools that have not worked. Basically people who will come and reinvent the wheel, you know, recycle old ideas that have not worked. We now need new, a new language, a new set of uh, ideas that are now going to be put on the table based on empirical evidence. And having been a person who works with young people for a living on a daily basis, works with research and having done it at the highest level, I believe that I do have uh, that skill with me to not only offer the NYDA uh, in terms of my own credibility as an activist, but also as intellectual rigor based on the qualifications that I've acquired during the process of infusing my activism advocacy with the technical skills that are required at this level. So the, to understand issues of unemployment, we now need to put the evidence on the table, which is that for the past 40 years, not even 20 years, for the past 40 years, the country has deindustrialized. The manufacturing sector will watch it collapse. And that is why there's a high rate of unemployment in the country. And therefore, if we're going to articulate now strategies moving ahead, we now need to put evidence on the table. And that is why the SIT administration has put the ball on the trade and industry department and reconfigured it to now include the section on competition. Because the mandate there now is to produce young people using the advocacy work of the NYTA, produce young people who are going to tap into the industrial sector because those are job absorbing sectors. If you want to talk about job absorbing sectors, not only in South Africa, but across the globe. It is a manufacturing and, indi and an industrial sector that is, that is able to absorb such uh, young people. Therefore, if we are to going to articulate the work of the board moving ahead, it needs to be collaborative with various stakeholders and entities and seek to create these youth incubators and innovation hubs that are going to create an ecosystem where everyone comes under the same basket where young people can access opportunities quicker, especially those who have business plans, and especially those who also are doing business that is absorb, that is labor intensive, you, you, you get me? But in this country, as my last point now as I wrap up, but in this country, the notion of innovation, it's, it's, it's viewed as if it's a Gauteng phenomenon. Because the, the innovation hubs and youth incubators that I'm talking about, there's one in Midrand, there's one in Pretoria, so innovation is regarded as a Gauteng phenomenon, a Cape Town phenomenon, and a Deben phenomenon. Now what I introduced to the board is how then do we specially deconstruct and deconcentrate innovation hubs away from the center, which is the, the, the urbanized provinces, into the rural provinces where I come from. Because it is, it is in those regions where the rate of unemployment is felt the most. Because there's no private sector that is going to employ young people in these rural provinces where I come from. Because there, if you don't have a job in the government, the prospects of you getting employment are very low. So we now need to decentralize these youth hubs, these innovation parks that I'm referring to, center them in the 53 regions across the country and set a target for the next three years as the board that we're gonna set up these youth hubs, collaborate with rural municipalities, entities and role players in, the, in these rural provinces, make these rural provinces also articulate these hubs according to the priorities of their provincial development, development plans. Because I'm sure the priorities of KwaZulu Natal and Eastern Cape are different. For instance, in the Eastern Cape, we have a long ocean belt where the maritime industrial sector can be triggered from, including tourism, plus an undertapped agricultural sector. Those industries, young people are underrepresented. So you need an innovation hub and a youth incubator there, collaborating with these entities to anchor young people into those opportunities and de-specialize innovation as if it's a phenomenon only of Gauteng. So what I bring to the board is this high credibility of interpreting this evidence information, new ideas to be brought to the table, new strategies that we can work with, you know, to uh, make sure that the NYTA enjoys the confidence of young people all over the country from all walks of life. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Bacha.
No, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, and, and thank you for recognizing me first, because um, I think that the opening remarks that were given kind of trigger um, further questions of engagement that we need to embark on. Um, I hear what you're putting forward. And firstly, I was thinking that where you are currently working is the best place for you to be because I thought you were kind of um, contributing meaningfully to those that um, are under your supervision. But as you went on, I felt that there could be a role for you to assist us in what we are trying to do. Now, what I want to get from you is a sense to the effect that if you were to be appointed as a board member in a country where there's more than 70% of youth unemployment, both rural and urban, um, what is it that, what are the key things that you can count that one, this is what I will do, two, this, thirdly, this, and fourthly, this? which would kind of give a sense to all of us sitting here that uh, probably you are one of the people that we are looking for to assist us in unlocking the kind of job opportunities of young people in the country. I hope I'm making sense, Chairperson. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, uh, Honorable Bacha, for that question. What I can say, as I was articulating earlier on, that the reason why we have a high rate of unemployment in this country is because the manufacturing and industrial sector has been collapsing over the past 40 years. That is a labor-intensive industry, you know, because that industry is able to absorb young people, both those who came to higher education institutions plus those who did not get given the opportunity to come to university. If you look across the world, all countries that, are, that have full employment, they have two major pillars about their economies. It's either they are industrial economies or in the event where they've de-industrialized, they have moved into the knowledge economy where they've now industrialized under the fourth and the fifth industrial revolution. Whereas for Africa, when it de-industrialized, it pulled back to supplying raw material to the economy. And that is why therefore, as we are producing these graduates, they're unable to absorb in the market because there's no industrial sector for them to have a safe landing. Now what, now what we need to do, the NYDA Act empowers the board in terms of what it must do under this crisis. If you trace the epistemic roots of the NYDA Act, it empowers the board with advocacy work and also youth enterprise support work. Where I want to emphasize, Chair, is on the advocacy work. Because with advocacy work, what we could do there, there's potential to collaborate, and I'm using the word collaborating deliberately. I don't like the word partnership, because partnership is flimsy and is task oriented. Rather, collaboration is more strategic and anchored on developing a sustainability metrics on how you make these strategies that are going to derive sustainable over a period of time. So on the advocacy work, there are young people who are designing clothes, who are designing shoes, who are designing this beret I'm wearing, a lady from Motherwell, uh, one Tunge Lion. Those such companies, if they can be empowered, right, through these collaborations, because there's only so much that the NYDA budget can do. Therefore, you need to rope in through these incubators I'm talking about, various departments, various social entrepreneurs, various entities. What youth work are they doing? What budgets do they have that, that are prioritizing young people? And how then can we categorize businesses of young people, right? Yes, there are those who are pursuing art, spaza shops, and so on, but then there are also those who are pursuing businesses that are industrial and labor intensive in nature, right? So supporting such businesses is what is going to unlock uh, the work that we do. And this is, this is not something foreign or difficult to do, Chair, because already in the country, we do have a manufacturing and industrial capacity. If you look at the 1992 state-owned enterprise that was established called Danel, Danel, is a military company that offers weapons, uniform, and also these uh, uh, converters of the military 
uh, state, including uniforms. They manufacture them in-house, and then they supply them to the African continent and other markets across the globe. Now, if Danel is able to manufacture uh, and have a manufacturing plant of these weapons, high-tech technology, it means, therefore, we should experiment with trying to have a situation where instead of basic education buying maybe projectors from Lenovo or from Microsoft at a high price, you could, uh, you could ask Danel to say, Danel, over the next three or six months, can you build 10, 20, or 500 projectors for these schools in Pumalanga and see where that will take us? So industrialization begins in those little uh, capacity that you have and you build it from within, you know? So it's as if sometimes we've never been to exile where we saw in the post-colonial government of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere realized that with his citizens that there's no one who's going to come develop Tanzania. They need to use agriculture for self-reliance purposes, the, the, the strategy of Ujama. We need to take lessons from that. If we want to industrialize our own country, we need to tap into our own capacity that we already have and grow from there. That is how you grow a country. No one is going to come develop South Africa for you. So the NYTA Act empowers the board to, to have that agency arm and also the youth enterprise support arm to go out there and find these entities, create these incubators, despecialize them to be in rural provinces where the majority of young people are found. Yeah, Honorable Mkweba, Honorable Matebula, Honorable Mpiti, you don't want to ask. Okay, Honorable Mpiti, Masiko. Honorable Natasha, if there's a sports chair. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mzileni, with your response uh, of how best we can um, assist uh, our youth in terms of uh, dealing with unemployment. But however, I just uh, went through your CV and one wish to question you if you can be able to give us um, the five main principles of governance, good governance, within the context of a democratic government and efficient public service. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, the principles of good governance are not only informed by the King Report, but they are also informed by the PFMA. The PFMA and the King Report breathe to each other coherently to produce these sets of five principles of good governance, which are transparency, accountability, being effective and efficient, using the rule of law, uh, you know, being transformative and sustainable in the work that you do with the resources of the public. If you trace the epistemic seeds of these documents, they first emerge from the 1989 World Bank report on structural uh, measures that they were trying to drive in Latin America and the African continent, which is today called the Global South. That was translated by the democratic government in 1996 through the GEAR and Employment and Distribution Policy called GEAR where now the government seeks to generate its own revenue to all, in order to drive the public service. And now that ultimately resulted in the PFMA that then translated also to the construction of good governance principles on how to run a professional and efficient public service. If you look at the existing PFMAs of other countries in Southern Africa, like uh, you know, Zimbabwe, Botswana, they actually take lessons from the South African good governance model and its, P and its PFMA strategy. That was also translated into the NEPAD document, the new uh, agenda for African growth, which was sponsored in the African Union by the former president Mbeki. Those are, one of, some, those are some of his brilliant legacies that he has left behind in terms of how the public sector must operate. Now, when we talk about the PFMA and good governance, these two strategies they speak to the management of assets, liabilities of 
the institution or the entity that you are that you are, you are leading, the accounting principles, the ability to write coherent annual reports, to deliver to parliament, to deliver to who you are supposed to report to, like the president. And what is important about doing those things properly at a high level with top quality is that you also grow the reputation of the entity. You also become you also become a trustworthy entity that is easier to invest in because they can see that your good governance and public finance management systems are in place. So you are able to be a trusted person with people's investments, you know? So it is important, therefore, that when we drive the NYDA Act as a board, we're able to pay attention to the fact that the credibility of the institution itself determines what are the dividends of leading it with good governance. And part of those dividends is having an organization that enjoys the confidence, not only of the public, but also of the private sector and other investors, so that the policy priorities of the sector administration, they become easier to advance using the NYDA board. So good governance, yes, it is there, but there must be competences in place to productively translate it into something that will drive the NYDA so that it can become more impactful from an advocacy and also from a youth funding point of view. In my view, if you are able to pull those uh, articulations together, you will have a credible board leading the NYD with good governance. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Master Zilin, mm. if you are elected to be a board member, what can you do to groom young women in becoming entrepreneurs? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for that question. You know, entrepreneurship, it's a skill that needs an investment in terms of time to inculcate it in the consciousness of a young person. And that is where the education system comes in. First question you need to ask is, how is our education system articulating the business acumen to produce young people, graduates from grade 12, with a consciousness for entrepreneurship? Because one, one of the mistakes we make with people who are looking at the education system from afar for us who are inside the system, education is not only a, an instrument to transmit skills for you to be in the labor market. Education is also a socialization weapon. It culturizes you into a particular way of thinking. You, you, are you with me? So that is why you'll find that young white boys who never went to school, how are they able to run the businesses of their family sustainably? It is because they were socialized into the argument of being entrepreneurs from a very young age. That is why today you'll find that in the free state, a 21-year-old 20, farmer is killing farm workers there. Because that 21-year-old white farmer, he was socialized to see black people in the farm as animals. You know? So the, edu the articulation of our education system needs to anchor these skills at a very young age. And how do you do that? You strengthen teaching competences and curriculum articulation in science, mathematics, and African languages. Why are these three subjects important? Because science, mathematics, and African languages, they equip a child with the skill to abstract their thinking, right? Because you see, with English, English is a very instrumental language. But when you speak, it's a clause. It's a clause as to leak. There are some things in African language that we cannot easily translate because our languages carry deeper philosophies that help us to interpret our reality. You understand? So African languages, science, mathematics, they need to be at the top of your priority. And the NYT, and the NYTA Act empowers the board to drive an advocacy work to interface directly with the Department of Basic Education to say that what can be done now 
to strengthen science, mathematics, and African languages from a teaching and from a learning point of view. So that by the time a person gets to grade 12, they don't only go out thinking about looking for employment, but they also go out with a variety of skills, some of them being self-driven to be entrepreneurs. They you need that winning culture amongst young people. So those kids don't just grow from the sky. You have to do the labor, the difficult labor as a government to develop those skills step by step. And that is, the, and that is where we're going to come in as the, as, as the board from an advocacy point of view to ensure that development of basic, basic education plays that role. Lastly, post, post matric, you have a higher education sector. You have colleges, you have universities. Yes, I understand the government, maybe it separated them for administrative or bureaucratic reasons. But in my view, the paradigm of basic education, higher education, and colleges, it needs to be one. They need to articulate one language amongst each other as far as the youth agenda is concerned to grow entrepreneurs, you know. So the skill of entrepreneurship does not come out of a four-day workshop. You need to invest in those skills at a very young age. You need to take time. You need a development plan in place. That vision 2030 that was adopted in 2012 is some of the ways you develop entrepreneurial skills. And no one is going to do that for you. You need to be a self-reliant government that takes effort in investing in black education. Because if you look at our traditions as black people in this country, we've always taken pride in black schools producing top results in science and mathematics. I even remember my own mother. Whenever my school achieved top results in mathematics and science, she was always proud that we were able to beat the white schools in the urban areas. So black people have always loved their own institutions. They've always loved their own townships and rural areas. And quality education for me would be best articulated by producing top results in science, mathematics, and African languages in rural schools. That's an education system that works for me. That's an education system that is transformative. Not the current articulation of taking black kids to white schools and think that magically the transformation and skills that you need are going to be produced. No, they are going to be dehumanized in those schools. But if you invest in your own institutions, invest in black education, love black education, that is how you're going to produce the spirit of entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you so much for the responses that you've given as well. Um, you know, we, we, we always talk about, you know, we need to look at sectors that need to grow the economy um, and make space for young people. And so I want to, to move into the question around market linkages, um, particularly for sectors um, in our country that are going to essentially be the job creating, job producing um, um, sectors in the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm just interested from your side, should you be appointed to the board, um, what exactly would you do in terms of creating market linkages with sectors that are not necessarily booming at the moment, but might boom in the next 10, 15 years? Because as young people, our role is not only to lead young people, but is to lead the country. And so when we do speak about job creation and speak about a strong economy that can facilitate uh, job creators and job seekers being able to, to, to flourish, uh, we, we can't only just speak about young people, we speak for the country um, and, and other older people who are looking to us as young people to, to have these, these ideas and, and formalize them. So I just want to hear out of interest, what is your, your take on um, those sectors that will boom in the next couple of years? But also, what is the plan to have those market linkages that link young people to them so that we, we can grow the economy? Thank you. 
Thank you, Honorable um, BT, uh, for that question. Uh, access to markets, it's one of the lacking uh, models that deny young people uh, from growing their businesses. You know, Honorable Mpitine, the importance of accessing the market is that it's going to help young people not only to open their businesses in January and then close them in December. Accessing markets helps businesses become sustainable for many years to come. And those are some of the challenges that is the NYT board we need to be seized with. Yes, we do provide grants to young people. We give a young person 5,000, 10,000 to start a business, which is a very small amount in my view, because with 10,000, you can't even open a law firm, you know? So we give them 5,000 and 10,000. They don't have any, there, there are no plans in place on how, them, on how can we help them access the market. And that is why business, and that is why SMMEs have a high rate of closure after the first 12 to 24 months. So accessing markets now is what is needed so that the people that are on the margins, the people that are on the townships and rural areas, they are able to create an asset base from their own businesses and continue to operate them for many years to come. Because you also need in place now an inheritance system amongst black people. Because what, 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 what facilitates easy access into the business economy for white young people, it is because their elders have created assets in place for their younger people to inherit which is they've created a sustainability matrix for those businesses. And how, where does that sustainability matrix come from? It comes from the access and the monopoly they have of the market. So we now need to build those assets. We now need to bring in the stock fields that are owned by our black women in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in, in the townships. We now need to begin articulating what is it exactly that treasury, what is it exactly that is holding treasury back from opening at least a few branches of the state bank. Because the state bank, what is it going to do? Because you see how our commercial banks are structured when they're honorable and pitting, eh? they are still structured in a traditional sense of providing cheap credit and grants to the industrial energy and the mining complex in this country. They don't care about people who have small businesses or those who are trying to start new businesses. Now a state bank in place a few branches just to experiment for the first two to three years. Where, how far is this thing going to take us? The state bank comes into that market, right, to provide such businesses with sustainable support. The NYDA Act empowers again the, 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 the agency now to use the second leg of youth enterprise support, link it with treasure, link it with the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. I spoke earlier about why the SIT administration optimized the Department of Trade and Industry to include competition. It is for, for that reason. The mandate of Trade and Industry now is to break down the monopolies that where the big companies are holding the market space. You need to break down uh, those monopolies, open up the markets for young entrepreneurs to access the market. And that is the advocacy work as the board, we now need to pay specific attention to, to that mandate given by the, to the Department of Trade and Industry by this administration. How now do we begin to articulate access to markets for young people so that they can run their businesses for many years to come? You see, Somalians, when they arrived in this country in 2006, they didn't ask for anyone's permission. Somalians arrived, they analyzed the township. If you notice all of them, they have shops in corners of the township because they knew that for every adult coming out of a township house, Let's make sure we capture them so that they don't go to pick and pay in town. Open spaza shops in each corner of the township so that when a person comes out and they need to do groceries, they find it feasible to access them next door because anyway, our people depend on social grants. They don't have funds. They cannot afford transport to the town every day. So Somalians did a, feasible, a feasibility study on how to create their own market and make their businesses sustainable. The 10 Somalians who opened businesses in my township in Zwelija, they've multiplied now. They are over 40. Because why? They managed to hold on to the market that they've created themselves. 
they didn't apologize. So we need now a breakthrough attitude that we need to empower our young people with. They don't need anyone's permission. They need to be supported sustainably so that they can break into the market and create it as a space and trade and industry and competition must come in to regulate that area and protect these industries that young people are starting. That is how you're going to grow a business sector as a, as a self-generating government that looks at young people not as objects to deliver, but as age and young people who just need support by the government. That's why the NDP articulates young people as agents of their own future. They're not waiting for parcels. They're not waiting for grants. They just need strategic support to continue being agents of their own future. That is how we are going to build an African country. Honorable Masigo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mzileni, for your responses. Ayacho Gamakosa at Uike Yonk. But nonetheless, Mr. Mzileni, I want to tap into your vast knowledge on research and development. You know that generally there's a concern out there that seeks to say that um, there is a general inability to monitor, to evaluate, and to account accordingly on government's investment on young people. Uh, you know, the youth development interventions, we, we cannot tell currently uh, the true effectiveness of these interventions that we are having. Now, in terms of uh, 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 your knowledge on research and development, how best do you propose that the NYDA can monitor and evaluate youth development across all government departments, across the private sector because you know that sometimes you know we always focus on what government is doing and we forget the private sector in terms of their responses to issues and challenges facing young people and also in civil society because you do have civil society organizations that are funded by government to do interventions on their behalf and address uh, issues of, of young people. And, and, and I'm saying that so that we are able to say that the tools that we are having uh, to monitor and evaluate these interventions are ensuring us that we, are ca we can account on issues of a, a, like a return on investment. Thank you very much, Chairperson. <coughs> thank, you, thank you so much, Honorable uh, Masiko, for that question. Um, on the item of research um, and development, which is something that I wake up and do for a living every day, um, firstly, because we are NYDA board, the capacity needed to articulate our work in research terms, it can actually be an enterprise in itself, you know that. Because you do have many graduates who have masters and honors that are unemployed. So we could say, we have this research project that we're going to run maybe in Pumalanga. How many graduates there have done masters and honors that can come in, meaning we create work for them, but also we're improving their research skills in the, in the process. So in that way, you, you do not need um, to, to, to make research this impossible funding uh, priority that is unaffordable, but rather what assets do you have in place already? Because DHET has produced so many graduates in qualifications where they are not receiving reception in the private sector but such skills can be utilized productively. One of them, inviting them now to be part of the NYDA work on developing research and development. So a master's degree, it's a research degree. So a person who has completed a master's has a research competences with them, but they're unable to be absorbed by the private sector. So we now need to go find those young people, interact with the University of Forte, interact with the University of uh, Limpompo, Mangosutu University of Technology, Cape Peninsula University, all black universities. Because we must not make the mistake of taking public funds back to privileged institutions. They now need to go to black universities that are in the Bantu stands, that are so underprivileged, where a graduate absolutely has no hope 
of getting any opportunity either to develop or to be trained or to get employment. So part of the research work that the NYDA has to do does not only depend on me as an individual. I can be a supervisor, but I need to see an influx of young people from black universities coming in to do productive work for the NYDA. And once that report, that research report comes through, young people have pride that, you know, the, the NYDA now is going to pursue this direction based on the research work that I have done. So in everything that we do, it needs to be followed up by monitoring, evaluation, and research. You know? So it can't end it only at monitoring and evaluation just to audit and track who's corrupt and who's not. But evaluation must all be followed up by research. Why? Because that is where you are going to be able to identify future opportunities. So that when the next board comes through, it is able to take the bait on from where we have left off and continue with the good work that we've been doing. So that each board, the, each board as we transition every three years, they feed evidence to each other so that we don't reinvent the wheel. You don't come in and, and reinvent all the terms that we, that we can see from our reports that we've said they don't work. You come in, you elevate the standard, right? Go into other sectors that we've recommended from the research work that we have done. So the beauty of research, uh, Honorable Masiko, is that it empowers an institution to take efficient, intelligent, and relevant decisions. You are not going to waste resources when you have research because you're working with evidence. You know what works, you know what doesn't work. You know rhetoric, you know slogans. They don't work. We're, we are sitting in a crisis now because we now need to put slogans aside. We need now to put old languages aside new ideas must be on the table and they must be informed by empirical evidence. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Petro. Yeah, well. There's no other hand, ne? Sesco be five months or six. <laughs> yeah, six. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pedro. Uh, Chair, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, let me thank um, um, Mr. Zikeni for um, participating in, in this interview um, and also for is um, deliberations and um, the way you answer the questions. Um, do you have a question to the, to the panel? <clears throat> From my side personally, uh, it has been an honor to be shortlisted as part of the 40 out of 1,000 applications. So being here for me, it's really an honor that I didn't expect. It has been a pleasure. And I want to thank the committee for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and good luck um, in all your future plans. Um, you are excused. Do you think that one day we could address you as Prof Mzilin? I look forward to that.
mic? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we'll wait. Yeah. So, I'm telling you. Yeah, no, we're, we're, I'm, I've agreed. Yes, yes, they are waiting. What, we're, we're checking Shelly now. They are waiting for you now. Yeah. yeah. You can talk. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, good evening. Uh -uh. Pretty. Um, Wait, Chair, we are still testing. Uh, oh. Oh. With Shelly, uh, the positioning of the gentleman who, who is interpreting. Yeah, we're waiting for Shelly. She must confirm. Yeah. Um, evening, Chairperson. Yes, Shelly. Um, if the gentleman, I just want to check, is he going to stand like that? Or. We need him to maybe sit if the if the candidate can see him. Oh, Mama Rashelli, I said I'm going to let his partner. We are one job at this. Yes, ma'am, because he's he's going to stand. I just need Bronwyn to please leave the the so that we can prepare. Can FCC leave for now? Huh? I'm talking to the final control center, ma'am, if she can go to a, 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 an advert, rather. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yes, I, I just need... Um, she will be fine like this. We'll cut to him, to her, sorry for that. But can I please... Um, Control, get the the, the, the the white shot quickly. Yes, if she can, she can see him. That is that will be fine. And and I will request the control to please folk, uh, zoom in so that also members can see her. And as well, we need to prepare so that member can also understand. I am worried. Is the gentleman's um, microphone there? Because when the lady is speaking, he needs to open the mic so that members can also understand what he is saying. And as well, on, on broadcast, we will hear you. You need to switch on your mic there, sir, um, when she starts talking. Yes, ma'am. Testing just to see if the microphone is audible. It is audible. It is audible. Thank you. We are much. fine. And then the, the, the sound and vision needs to share this on the screens so that members can also see from the screens too. I think we will be ready, ma'am. Um, Ms. Sephora, if you can please give us a countdown from FCC quickly. Okay, Ms. Monso, just hold on. Yes, yes. Uh, please tell Bronin to fade to fade out this interview, this uh, one. Uh, we'll take the forty-five seconds thing, ma'am, and then we'll come from there. Okay. Can she fade on to to that forty-five seconds thing? Then we will count down and chairperson. We will count down. I'll count down to three, and then from there I'll keep quiet. Just allow uh, about three seconds, and you can start, ma'am. Thanks. Mado Bronwyn is not fading. I'm I'm watching the the, the live broadcast. Bronwyn is not fading.
Hi, hi. Please stand by for countdown. Mado, please count down. 20, 20 seconds. 20 seconds to you, Chaperson. 20 seconds to the Venus. 20 seconds from me. And the sun is our country. our past, improving our lives. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Good evening. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Good evening and welcome, Ms. President Zobi, um, to this interview session. My name is Marin Shekillian, the Chairperson of the Select Committee in the National Council of Provinces for Health and Social Services. Um, I want you to be very comfortable and relax. If you're a little bit nervous, drink a little bit of water. I will hand over to the chairperson in the committee room to introduce herself and the rest of the members of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, chairperson. Uh, Ms. Pritim Zobe, uh, you're welcome. Uh, my name is Nontlantla Ndaba. I'm the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. Uh, I'm co-chairing this uh, panel with the, the Honorable Chair who was just welcoming you now. Uh, we wish you good luck and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Can you brown brown? Are you going to uh, also interpret for us? Because we we'll want someone to interpret for us. Uh, 